All right. Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We have been meditating on Christian warfare, uh, the distinctions, the differences that there are between the warfare of the Christian and the warfare of the world and how it is that that, that requires certain things of the Christian, a certain way of equipping yourself, a certain way of thinking, a certain way of engaging in battle. We are, we are not out. As Peter has stressed, I believe, numerous times, to hate back, to revile back, but rather to pray for those that are, as we have been at a previous point in our lives, slaves of sin, slaves to the mentality of this world. This is the reality that, that we face as Christian soldiers marching us to war. The, the fact that the enemy before us is spiritual. It, it's, not, it's not Joe and Bessie or, you know, Mary and, and, and whomever else. It, it is the reality under which they are bound. The fact that they are shackled and love the bondage of sin that they are in. That is what we are fighting against. That, that is what we are to be equipping ourselves. We, we realize that once we were not a people and now we are. And so because of that, that is supposed to make us more generous, more forgiving, more Christ-like in our interactions with people who despise us because we recognize what this is. And so we are told to arm ourselves. And this isn't the first time. Peter's already said it in chapter 1. We are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking as Christ. Christ who suffered. When we talk about the perfections of Christ, the Word of God doesn't give us Jesus at five years old or seven years old, but we do see that the animosity within Christ's family was relatively high, at least with his brothers. His brothers were reviling him and telling him, well, if, if you're this big deal, why don't you go and reveal yourself at this feast? Quit hiding, bro. Go and show yourself. You're this big thing, right? And we stop and we think that Christ is our example in how he responded. He, he didn't respond sinfully. He didn't respond vitriolically. He didn't say, do you understand that, that, that I have the authority to condemn you right now? Or as he responded to Pontius Pilate, I could call down legions of angels to come to my defense right this very second. And so the long-suffering of Christ is something we are to arm ourselves with. The, the gentleness of Christ that led inevitably because of His perfection to the salvation of at least two of His brothers that we know of. Jude and James. But we are to arm ourselves with this way of thinking as we engage in every interaction whether it's with the government or with an unbelieving spouse or in the workplace or in our families, we are to think like Christ and respond like Christ in every situation. We respond with truth and remember the reality that Christ stated that the world hates us, hates Him for declaring the truth that they love wickedness and so that, that moves us, and I don't want us to think that because the title of this message is Christian Responsibilities, that there's somehow uh, that there's a, a big shift from thinking about Christian warfare. No, it's just the responsibilities of the Christian which have been talked about as regards our interactions and our warfare with the world. We, we don't revile back, we don't bite back, we don't hate back, we rather recognize the fact, hey, I know where I'm going. 
I know how things are going to be. I know my eternity. And my God has given me the commandment to represent him against this person who hates me right now. What am I supposed to want the most for this person? That they die, that they go away, uh, the, that they be as far away from me as possible? Those might be some part of your thinking. But at the forefront of your mind should be what Christ has commanded. Pray for those that hate you. Pray for those that persecute you. And what is your prayer? Lord, save them. Save them. You saved me. There but for the grace of God would I be. I would be a reviler. I would be a hater. I would be one of those people were it not for your grace. And so we get to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. We'll be meditating on chapter 7 this morning, but we'll read the whole of the section so that we can understand what we're seeing as far as the responsibilities that are laid out for the Christian. And so we read now, this says the word of God, the holy and infallible word. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and adore you, Lord, for your incredible goodness. We thank you once again, as we have throughout the last five years, for the, the incredible way in which providentially we are talking about the same things in, in various different places. In our, our catechism question, we are talking about what we're going to be reading and, and studying and immersing ourselves in this morning and in our class on the, the, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, we were also talking about things that are relevant and connected and, and, and talking about exactly these things. Father, we thank you for your absolutely wonderful and glorious control over everything in creation. Father, we pray unto you asking that, Lord, we be as your sheep, those that hear with ears opened by the Holy Spirit and eyes that see, a mind, Father, and a heart that are willing to engrave and retain your word and act upon it, Lord, that we be and act and move as your sheep under the great shepherd, Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. And so, when we come to stopping to think about the end of all things, the end of times, and, and how this is supposed to impact our responsibilities. I asked, as I, as I told you all this morning a little bit ago, I, I asked my wife last night, uh, what would you think about Jesus coming right now? Is this very second, this moment, this hour, today? And it was the same question that I've asked throughout the years as I've had the honor of preaching first to myself and secondarily to you all about the supremacy and glory and beauty and value of Christ Jesus for the last five years. And so I've had five years of immersing, first and foremost in the studies, uh, of Christ's beauty and supremacy. Is he truly the pearl of great price? Well, that affects how you think. And so I asked in light of this to my wife, would you want Christ here now, right this very second? And I told you guys 
the, the answer that she, that she gave. And that, that is the answer that, that a lot of people have. Well, if you're talking about just me, then yeah, I don't have any, any big issue with it. But here's, here's the thing that we have to consider. Is it too soon? As you look at your life and you think, if Christ was to come right now, am I joyously anticipating and waiting? Would we say it every single Sunday? And, and I would hope that with every Sunday that passes, it is less of a repetitious, ritualistic recitation that is void of any meaning. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And the question is, is that a, a truly deep and profound and real to you reality? Or are you like many other people thinking, well, it's a little too soon. If the Lord can wait another five, ten years, then maybe that would be best. We, we have to consider that. We have to stop and think, as I asked a couple of years ago or even last year, if you were to die right now, are you joyful in it? Or are you thinking, well, I would miss this person or that person or this relative or this child of mine or this grandchild of mine? And, and the, the reality of it is that this is where the rubber meets the road as regards where Christ is in our hearts and in our minds and how valuable Christ is. M many times Christians are vilified when they read and they preach and they talk about the words of Christ when he says that he must be more valuable than mother, father, brother, sister, and children, and even than your own life. But the fact of the matter is there are many professing Christians and many genuine Christians who at the end of the day still value something other than Christ. Just slightly bit more. Maybe not in word, but certainly in thought in the practical level. They see their, the end of their life as a loss. And we must allow for the scriptures to mold and inform our thinking. I've often heard people misquote Paul and say, well, you know, Paul said that it's better for, for us to stay so that we can be useful for the Lord rather than going to Christ. And many times I've had to say, no, that wasn't the context of Paul. Paul was saying, it would be better for me. And I desire, my desire is to be with Christ. Nevertheless, it is profitable for you that I remain. This is the biblical context. This is the example that we have. How do you view going to heaven over against being fruitful in your life? And, and the, the, the context that we have in Scripture is, your desire should be to be with Christ now. Nevertheless, the time you have on earth, as Peter has said already, can be lived out in obedience to God's will. And so as we see, the end of all things is at hand. We have to remember that the way that the scriptures have set the example for us is that Christians are to live with the hopeful expectation and the desire of Christ arriving, coming again now. And that every one of our actions is to be lived out in that glorious expectation. We, we should think about how the end of all things is at hand should impact the Christian who has armed themselves with Christ-like thinking. John Calvin comments saying, Though the faithful hear that their felicity is elsewhere than in the world, yet as they think that they should live long, this false thought renders them careless and even slothful, so that they direct not their thoughts to the kingdom of God. Hence, the apostle that he might rouse them from the drowsiness of the flesh 
reminds them that the end of all things was nigh. By which he intimates that we ought not to sit still in the world, from which we must soon remove. He does not at the same time speak only of the end of individuals, but of the universal renovation of the world, as though he had said, Christ will come shortly, who will put an end to all things. And, and that's really the crux of the matter. We can say, all right, Lord, help me be like Paul and, and love and desire to be with you more, but begrudgingly accept the reality that it, it is fruitful for others that I remain alive. But the, the fact of the matter is that that's not the operation that most people have. Or you can start that way, but then your prayer needs to be, Lord, help that to be a constant in my mind. And how do you do that? By maintaining the reality of Christ's second coming at the forefront of your mind. The inheritance at the forefront of your mind. So that you can keep things in the perspective that they're supposed to be. Christ is soon to come. This is the theme of the Christian life, the anticipation of every faithful believer, the encouragement to finish strong, the encouragement to follow in obedience and to be found working. Now, notice that Peter has already spoken throughout this epistle about the second coming of Christ as a key encouragement for faithfulness, and for obedience to Christ. He's spoken about the second coming of Christ. If you think about it, chapter 1 had a similar phrasing about mental warfare. And, and about how the Christian is to look to Christ. And to look to His coming for encouragement. And in chapter 1, verse 13, Peter says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded... Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you remember, it's been several weeks, so I don't expect you to, don't worry. If you remember that far back, one of the things I said is when Peter's talking about at the revelation of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the second coming. We're talking about the final judgment. We're talking about the last day. And what was the instruction? All the way back in chapter 1, prepare your mind, be sober, and if, and, if, and if we read where we are here, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded. The same instructions. Be sober-minded. In chapter 1 he says, fully, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then again in chapter 2, Verse 12, Peter states that one of the ways that we are to be found working when Christ returns is by our conduct in the world. So, prepare your mind, set your mind right, set your hope in Christ, set your hope on His coming. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, we are instructed, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God right here, right now, today, tomorrow, in a month. No. On the day of visitation. This is the thing. We often talk about the reality. We sing it in our hymns. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. What? That Jesus Christ is Lord. And we sing present tense. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. And this is the reality upon which we base the, 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 the confidence that every single knee will bow down, every single tongue will confess in this life or in the final day that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will not be a single worldly person that is hellbound that will not bow the knee and recognize the truth that Christ is king. And so because of that, Peter says, keep your conduct 
among the Gentiles honorable. And we, we talked about and went into what that looked like. For God's glory was what Pastor Aaron said when he preached on, on, the, on uh, verse 13 through 17. It was for God's glory. You keep your conduct honorable. So that when they revile you, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Because they can't see everything right now. They can't see your obedience clearly. Only the illumined by the Holy Spirit will be able to see that. If the Lord redeems those that revile you, they'll be able to see, wow. You know, it was because of your life testimony that I was able to come to Christ. But if they don't on, on this life, then they will, on the day of visitation, be shown. This was my faithful child living out their obedience, being Heavenly minded thinking to the end of time. We often are exhorted by the word of God that we will have to give an account for every thoughtless word we speak. And that's great and that's good. But we also have to remember that the word of God sets before our minds the reality that our very actions will be shown as fruitful at the end as well. It will. All, all of those battles, all of those things. You know, I, I've said it before. If there was one great encouragement that I got from seeing in, in Deuteronomy and in Numbers, you know, every single little tribe coming up and they all have the exact same offering, the exact same amount of silver, was the fact that every single faithful congregation, no matter how small, 15 people soaking wet at First Baptist Church in Osceola, Iowa is precious. This sacrifice, our worship, our glorification of God is written down and preserved and will be shown at the end of days as a pleasant aroma before the Lord. Don't think for one moment, oh, well, it's just us. It's not just us. It is something that will be shown, will be shown, and we have that promise, will be shown to glorify God on the day of visitation. Every one of your personal battles against sin every single week, every time you flick through the TV and you skip that channel, every time you skip through this ad, or as Pastor Aaron was talking about this morning, you block this channel on YouTube or you block this person with their nearly pornographic at you know things will be shown to be a glorious thing but at the forefront of the mind should always be the end is near the end is nigh the end is upon us and once again we were encouraged here following so we had chapter one and chapter two before that huge section that went all the way into chapter 3, about how to glorify God in our conduct. And once again, here in chapter 4, we're being told to gird our minds with Christ-likeness, to fix before our minds the biblical reality of His return. We have to understand this. How were we supposed to set our hope fully? What were we supposed to set, pardon, our hope upon the grace that is to come? Our hope is supposed to be set future, looking at the future. This is why we proclaim every Sunday when we partake of the Lord's Supper, come Lord Jesus, come. It is a plea. And I would hope that with every passing week it becomes more real, more of a genuine plea. I want Christ to come today. Of course, when I said this, my wife said, hey, that's, I guess that's one of the ways in which your depression has helped you out. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I glorify the Lord in that. I'm aware that I think distinctly to other people. And, and because of that, my, my priorities have, by God's grace, been able to be rearranged to where I do. I want Him here now, right this very second. I don't want to live tomorrow if I don't have to. I want Christ to be here and eternity to happen. But why? Why? And that's the key difference between how I have handled the depression of my mind and how the secular person does it. The secular person just doesn't want to go through the battles 
of the next day. It just doesn't want to go through the ups and downs of depression and anxiety and X and Y and Z. The Christian, my reason for it isn't because I don't want tomorrow to happen. I don't want to see my beautiful little three-year-old grow up a little more and see the smile on my beautiful wife and her gorgeous blue eyes. No, that's not that's not it at all. It's because I want my Christ. I want my Jesus. I want that pearl of great price. I want to glorify and to honor him. And that's the way that every Christian is supposed to say it, supposed to live it out. It should be more than mere words. Come, Lord Jesus. It should be a plea from the bottom of our hearts for Christ to come this day in our lifetime. It should be the source of strength and an exhortation for us as as we see and as we've seen Jesus stress in the parables the importance of his people being faithful and that faithfulness being displayed in not laxity but in obedience to his work whether it was the, the, the the parable of the talents and seeing that Christ said hey be found working I've given you these talents you're good at this not because of some random evolutionary fluke no you're good at this because I have gifted you with this specific talent to be used for my honor and glory and not for you to bury it in the sand. Whether it's the parable of the talents or the parable of the slothful worker, the one that said, man, Christ isn't coming even in my lifetime. It's easy street for me. I don't have to worry about praying to the Lord of the harvest I don't have to worry about what's going to happen with my grandchildren. I'm going to take that Hezekiah mentality. You know what? Whatever problems may come, at least as long as they don't come in my lifetime, it's fine. As long as God's good to me while I'm alive, it's all gravy. No, of course not. We must leave an inheritance. And that inheritance that we leave must be a spiritual inheritance that says every day live it out working for Christ, being found so that when Christ comes, He doesn't catch you like a thief in the night. He catches you working. He shows up in great triumphal parade and you are found like one of those wise virgins, ready, with the oil prepared and with a proper amount of forethought to think He's coming and I want Him to find me working. I want him to find me doing what he commanded me to do. That's the key point. As God's redeemed, we must be about the work which we have been commanded to do while we still live. This is the theme that Peter has been highlighting. Don't sin like you did before you came to Christ. Even if that means you'll be reviled. You've more than sinned enough. Look to the external sign of your adoption, your baptism, and remember that the sin-loving, sin-enslaved you is dead. And the man or woman that lives now lives in Christ and for Christ. Look at your life not as just one more battle against sin. In a laundry list full of battles. That's a jaded view. We're not supposed to go, oh man, another day of fighting this body, another day of of war against this flesh. No, rather, look at these things with the return of our king in mind. Hey, it's just one more battle. One more battle and my my Christ is coming. He's coming soon. And and I want him to, to, to find me just joyously waiting for him, knowing that we are in the last days, the end times, the last hour. This is one of the largest themes that permeates the New Testament. The fact that when Christ came, he inaugurated the coming of the kingdom. The words, the kingdom is at hand. Christ preached them. Or one of the other ways that it could be translated or that we could understand it is, the kingdom is among you now. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. That's the way we are to understand it. The inauguration happened when Christ came. Ever since the ascension 
Every Christian has lived in a state of expectation of the consummation promised by the King, Jesus Christ. It's that, it's that theological thing about now and not yet. We live in the expectation of the consummation. And that has an impact. But there are many, many, many Christians who are living their life like the slothful worker. The Lord is tarrying. Hey, he's gone on a long journey. He's not going to be back for a while. I, I can do things my way. So we're going to spend our time this morning seeing some, some of how this theme of the last days, the last hour, the end of all things permeates the New Testament and how it's heralded and how not only is it a key theme, and I'm not going to give an exhaustive list, but how the, the latter days are supposed to impact the mind because we have to ask ourselves, why did Peter say the end of all things is at hand? And then say, by the way, this, therefore, this statement is supposed to impact how you behave as regards self-control and sober-mindedness and your prayers and all of these preceding things. So we, we stop and we think, for example, just within this epistle. In chapter 1, verse 5, Peter encourages us to look forward to the inheritance which is ours in Christ Jesus and says of the Christian who awaits the inheritance, that this inheritance is by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed when? In the last time. So we're looking to the inheritance and and wh whether or not you agree with, I have a mansion waiting for me in glory, or, or you, you, you go more along the lines of ESV and you think uh, there's a room being prepared for you. Look, the point is Christ has got a place for you. And that place is in heaven. And that place and that inheritance that comes with that place and with being in the household of God is being kept for you. And not only is that inheritance being preserved far away from any corruption, but you are being preserved. You are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed, that consummation in the last time. It's, I'm not building my treasures here. Or, or as Martin Luther said in, in the, the hymn, Almighty Fortress is our God, let goods and kindreds go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. And we don't look to the things here as what is in supreme value. And then again in verse 7 of chapter 1, the encouragement continues that though we face diverse trials and our faith be tested by fire, it will be to God's glory in the second coming. But we're not going to be in prison, shackled up, missing some teeth because the guards beat us, or in prison because we had a bumper sticker that says, I love my church, I love Jesus Christ, and, and sit there and, and really at times be able to think, man, this is, this, is, this is awesome. Not everyone can be like our brothers and sisters in Christ in China who are like, oh, you haven't been to prison? Pff, man, just wait, it's awesome. They look forward to it. No. Peter says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor, not now, not in this life always, but at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, it's at that point in time that we'll be able to say, Lord, everything that I went through, all of the, the difficult times, all of those times that I was in battle mortifying the sin in my life, all those times that I armed myself with Christ-likeness and prayed for those that were persecuting me and prayed for those that hated me and prayed for those that called me a bigot and an idiot who couldn't even possibly understand any scientific anything. Lord, I glorify and honor you because every Every single one of those signs that I faithfully represented you, someone out there looked at me and said, man, I want what he or she has. I want what this person has. 
I thank you, Father, for the fact that all of my family difficulties that I had for faithfulness to you ended up showing that love, that peculiar love that I'm supposed to have for those that are in the body over against those that are out. And of course, we've already touched on 1 Peter 1, 13 and 2, 12, and we're in chapter 4, verse 7 now. And, and in all of this, there's a theme, expectation, inheritance, look to the future, look past this life. Look past the temporary difficulties. Look past the hardness that, that's around you right now and understand there is something far greater, far better, far more glorious that you could ever truly comprehend this side of heaven. Now we look at other places in the New Testament. Paul commended the church in Thessalonica for the way that they were living this out. The way that the church of Thessalonica was living out the truth of hopeful expectation of Christ's return and how that was moving them to obedience. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, Paul says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is how they were living. And they were hospitable, and they were, they were gracious hosts, and they were living out this wait for the Son who is to come from heaven. They were living it out, and we see that Paul instructed them, the, the, the church of Thessalonica, the, to, to live in that expectation of the eminence of Christ's return, and, and, and we see how that was impacting their lives in chapter 4, verses 15 to 18. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of our Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will always be with the Lord. And then the encouragement, setting your eyes upon that. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with what words? Hey, Christ is coming. And if we are alive when Christ come, don't worry. We'll meet him in the air. We will see him and we will be a part of that glorious reception of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an encouragement to continue in obedience. I will see the Lord. Or as we sang this morning, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King and how that impacts everything that we're doing. No more crying now. We are going to see the King. Seeing Him is at the forefront of everything. Again, Paul writing to the church in Rome through the Holy Spirit says the very same things as Peter does here in chapter 4. He says to them, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, and again, the day is at hand. The end of all things is here. The end is nigh. So because of that, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. You see those same things? The end is here. Arm yourself. The end is here. It means action on your part. The end is here. So then let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and in sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The coming of Christ should motivate us to move forward in obedience. Not in the, the same things that Peter was talking about, orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality, but rather to make no provision for the flesh, no provision for gratifying sinful desires. And again, the theme of the last days in 1 Corinthians 7.29, 
This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. The instruction was move forward in faithful obedience. Move forward because the appointed time has grown very short. This is the mentality that every Christian is supposed to have. The end is at hand. We stop and we think of the wonderful and glorious example that through God's decree and God's providence we have in first century Christianity. Those men and women of God that lived in that joyous expectation, Christ is coming and he's coming soon. And that means he's coming in my life. And the example that they set forth before us that is recorded in the New Testament is supposed to be one that we are to imitate generation after generation, day by day, until the coming of our Lord. John likewise gives instructions to kill sin, to serve God, because the worldly things are temporal and Christ is coming. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 19. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the, of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So we have those instructions. Don't love the world. Again, the arming, the, the battle, the equipping, the, the warfare of the Christian. Don't love the world, don't love the things of the world, the f- desires of the flesh, the desires of the, uh, the, 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 the eyes, the pride of life. And then in verses 18 and 19, we have the reason. Children, it is the last hour. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now, and many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Do you look around you and see a world-hating anti-Christ system? Do you see those people that are saying, kill whomever you want, kill the babies, live your life in licentiousness and in drunkenness and in orgies. You have this and as an inalienable right. This is how you love your neighbor. Good. Not good in, in, in the ultimate sense, but good because it's a sign. Hey, there are many antichrists. There's a lot of people out there that are spokesmen for these perversities and for these evils. And that is good because therefore we know now that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. As time progresses and we see those that are going to choose to be faithful to God and those that are definitely going to choose to be faithful to the ways of the world, it is a sifting that allows us to see clearly who are the true followers of Christ. When all of a sudden, simply stating biblical truth has quote-unquote Christians calling you uh, a bigot and an unforgiving, hateful person when they say, well, I don't know what kind of God you serve, but that's not my God. That's, that's, that's what the Bible says. It is just a further sign of the reality that we are in the last days. James, as we've already talked about and we've covered James, I wanted to make sure that I talked about things that we've, we've covered in the last couple of years. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And again, that, that wonderful agrarian. I'm, I, the more and more I read it, the more and more I appreciate the agrarian examples because it does require a great level of patience, a great level of faith in God's providence. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord 
is at hand. So we have all of these elements that are part of the Christian responsibilities, Christian responsibilities and Christian warfare. Arm your mind, don't love the world, don't love the things of the world. And every single time, what is at the forefront? What is before and what is ahead? Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Be patient because Christ is coming. How should you be patient? Well, man, I've been praying for this person's salvation and I've been talking to them about Christ for five years and nothing has happened. God is the one that works at salvation. Like a farmer can't make it rain. A farmer has to depend before we had all this wonderful technology, right? Old, old, old school farming. Before hardcore irrigation systems were a thing where you could tap into the aquifer even when you live in somewhere like, you know, New Mexico. What did you depend on? God. The early and the latter rains. Those things would God, which God in His benevolence gives to everyone in the world, but to Christians specifically, are examples of patience. God's the one that's going to make this grow. God's the one that's going to have this be fruitful. Until then, what is my responsibility? Be patient. Establish your heart. Firm it. Strengthen it because the coming of the Lord is at hand. The author of Hebrews writes that we are to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see what? The day drawing near. What day? The day of the Lord's return. We are to live faithful lives, killing sin, representing Christ, encouraging and exhorting one another to love and good works, meeting together, establishing and arming our hearts and minds for a life exemplary in obedience to the will of God, a life where we do not love the world or the things of the world like drunkenness and debaucheries and fornication and orgies or any other form of sexual immorality or deviancy, but rather love God so much that it diametrically impacts every facet of our existence. A love that has Christ at its core, His work, His preciousness, his righteousness, His gloriousness, His obedience unto the Father, and His commands. A love that longs and yearns and pines after Christ and simply, truly, and sincerely cannot wait for His return. A love so consuming that it moves us to be faithful and to want to be found faithfully working at the return of our glorious and majestic King. This is what it means to be a Christian. To live in the now and not yet. Redeemed now, saved now, and awaiting the consummation to come and the glorification to come in the not yet. This is what informs Peter's Further statement in verse 1. Therefore, because this, this, the end is here and everything that comes with a mind set upon the end that is to come, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So as I expected, we got through the first part of verse 7. The latter part of verse 7 will be a part of what will continue next week of the Lord allows we close with the words of paul in second corinthians 13 11 finally brothers rejoice aim for restoration comfort one another agree with one another live in peace and the god of love and peace will be with you and all of god's people said amen